How's it I, going? I came, good. I, I came on. You were covering the theoretically intense story about a guy that uh, left his wife for a Ukrainian refugee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a hard hitting one. Uh, ten days is all it took with the Ukrainian refugee to leave his girlfriend of ten years. That's intense. <laughs> Love works in various ways. <laughs> Uh, what have you been up to? What have you been reading today? Uh, I've been reading Foster's, uh, John Bellamy Foster's The Return of Nature, uh, Socialism and Ecology, because I uh, put myself up to the test of doing a review, so they sent me a free book to do the review, but it's a like close to 600-page monster. <laughs> and and um, monthly review books have like really small letters, so it's going to be one that will probably take me a couple months to to work through slowly but um foster is in in my view i think perhaps the the best well-read the most well-read marxist alive today um and he deals with a of a, a point in in marxism which is ecology that i feel like every strand is comfortable with so it's not a very it, it's not a place where you find too many people within the marxist camp disagreeing so um, in terms of my academic work, I, I've been more and more getting into the stuff that uh, he's writing. And we read Ian Agnes, or Angus, Ian Agnes. I, I can't remember which one it is, but um, I feel like it was like the Angus Burger. But uh, we, read him, we read him in undergrad, and he runs the Climate and Capitalism page now, and he's, he's pretty good as well. But um, I find that what I enjoy the most out of this uh, reading is just the depth of uh, scientific knowledge that that Foster has. Uh, it gets to a point where I, when I'm doing research for the the book project that I'm working on, which is focused on dialectics, it kind of gets to a point where it's a repetition of quotes that I've already seen, letters that I've already read, and I'm kind of just judging based on how well the person put together information that I've already seen. But when I engage with Foster, there's so much that's new, um, so it, it it's a, a a genuine learning experience, and that's what I enjoy the most. Huh, that's really cool. I was thinking about that book we read today, uh, the Ian Angus book, Facing the Anthropocene. Um, I re Carlos and I had like a, I don't know what you would call it, just like a socialist ecology class almost, but um, it was really interesting how they set up the class. They had us read Ishmael. Which is like, if you had to give it an ideology, it would be like anarcho-primitivist, basically. Sort of like a return to nature type thing. Um, and basically, the, the thesis of the book is that humans think we're, you know, increasing in productivity and technology and intelligence. But actually, we're on a plane that's on fire, speeding towards the ground, you know. And eventually, we're going to crash and, and nature is going to lash out against humanity. Um, you know, and, and humanity is kind of going to fall apart. But then after we read that book, um, the professor had us read this Ian Angus book called Facing the Anthropocene, um, which shows how Marx was talking about the metabolic rift that's created between humans and nature um, within capitalist production. Um, and Marx is talking about this, you know, all the way back in the, uh, the 19th century. Um, he's realizing that, that capitalist production is not harmonious with nature. Um, it's production that constantly seeks to expand um, and accumulate and, and cares nothing for the, the natural processes of the natural world. Um, so Angus basically makes the argument that, you know, humans aren't on a plane that's on fire crashing towards the ground. Um, we've just lost control of production. You know, production is very uh, anarchic under capitalism. Um, and if we can take control of production, we can continue to produce in a way that uh, takes care of the needs of everyone, um, but also in a way that's harmonious with nature. So I don't know. Do you do you still agree with that thesis of Angus after um, reading Foster now, Carlos, or um, do Foster and Ian Angus defer at all? Well, you you mentioned uh, Ishmael. One of the things that, looking back at it now, I find the most funny was uh, I think the dude took like thirty years to write the book, and in thirty years you should be able to write a better book <laughs> because <laughs> because how do you end up with this BS thesis that it's just like human development 
um, and humans that are like this, humans in general that are at, at, at the core of this ecological catastrophe. Um, I, I feel like after, you, you can maybe stay there for like a few years, but if you're really doing research for a book and not just saying, you know, I'm doing research and I'm writing, but you're really not doing much. If you're really doing research, eventually you come to the realization that it's capitalism. It's the way we relate to one another and to nature, um, which is the basis of what a motive of, of production is. It's human, specific human relations mediated through certain uh, productive instruments that use nature in order to produce for the human community. And that has different ends in different societies. But how do you not get to the conclusion that it's, it's class society and specifically capitalism that's, that's at the core of this, especially as someone who's writing in what we now call the Anthropocene, right? In the uh, post-50, uh, post, post-World War II uh, fossil capitalism, right? So uh, that's one of the things that I look back at the book and it's like, you took so much time writing it just to produce something that's, you know, like an undergrad could have written it. But uh, in terms of the, the metabolic rift, yeah, I, I absolutely, um, I agree with it more now and what's interesting is that that theory doesn't come from, from Marx. Uh, Marx uses the terminology conjointly for the first time, but he takes it from a German scientist, uh, Justice von Liebeck. And Justice von Liebeck, just from studying uh, the inability of the soil to replenish nutrients on the basis of how production was taking place, he realized there's something wrong. Like you're taking away from the soil to produce certain things and something's not coming back. And so you had these things called guano imperialism, where the U.S. and various uh, various of the what Lenin would call the great powers were going around just looking for guano so that they can replenish the soil with nitrogen and these other things that it needs in order to be productive. And so just from that study of, of how it is that how we produce uh, makes it so that we are unable to give back to the soil what we took from it, he realized very quickly that, you know, it's the way we produce. It, it has nothing to do with human nature, with, you know, uh, some uh, uh, productive agricultural development that took place ages ago. It has to do with, with capitalism and that if you structure uh, the way you produce in a rational way that takes into account the ability to replenish those, those nutrients, um, you're, you're, you're good to go. You can grow insofar as you're conscious of that and you have a, a planned uh, production. So what, what's interesting is that, um, and, and Foster dives into this a whole lot more than uh, Angus ever would. I'm sorry, I have three chihuahuas just going crazy. But Dang it. <laughs> one of the interesting things is that the Soviet ecology was um, basically at the vanguard of, of these studies you have in a in uh, Nikolai Bukharin's book on, uh, on historical materialism. It was basically a textbook. Uh, and, you know, there's things to be critiqued in that textbook. He's, he's quite reductive and he reduces historical materialism basically to technological developments only. So it's very one-sided in that sense. And that has been the object of uh, interpretation when people have looked at the book, uh, people like Lukács and Gramsci. But uh, there's a chapter in the book where he's talking about the equilibrium of nature and society. And he's using Marx's theory of the metabolic rift. And it's extremely rich ecologically. So there was a, the Soviet Union was at the vanguard of this and like the third um, international conference of, of, uh, of scientists for ecology that took place in London. They had invited um, I believe one Soviet scientist, and they, they weren't really expecting them to show up because it was, I believe, in 30, 31. Um, and, and so there, there wasn't, like, air travel wasn't that frequent at the time. But this massive Soviet plane shows up <laughs> in London, and like 30 scientists walk out, and they give a few conferences, and uh, they just hit it out of the ballpark. And the, the Marxists that are there in London that watch this, they're they are very impressed by how developed the Marxism of the Soviet Union was, especially with the scientific dimension of, of ecology. So it's in Lenin's thought, it's in, uh, it's in even in Kautsky. Kautsky writes a book on agrarian condition sets, actually pretty darn good. Uh, that's before he becomes the renegade Kautsky with uh, World War I. But yeah, 
I can go on and on about this, but I'll, I'll try to live myself. No, you're good. Um, that's interesting. I think for all of us, um, it's it's interesting how many fields, uh, Marx and Engels sort of unlocked. Like uh, anthropology is the same way. Now that I'm, you know, finishing up reading Origins for like the third time, it's like <laughs> I mean, Lewis Henry Morgan uh, and and Darwin did a lot basically to give a historical materialist analysis of the development of humankind or um or yeah just the historical development of humans um but the the dialectical materialist analysis allows them to take that so much further um and if you look at like you said with the soviet ecologists what they were able to do um what the chinese ecologists are currently doing and and how quickly mm-hmm. china is moving towards uh sustainability compared to the rest of the world it's like um it's basically allowed them to be uh, on the cutting edge of science so and and that's basically Engels' whole point with, with Origins, if people haven't read that book, like, uh, like there were so many myths in the field of anthropology, like these idealist myths that had just been perpetrated for years and years and years, um, and then when they took a historical and dialectical materialist analysis or a, a dialectical look at it, um, they were able to take the field so much farther and, and uh, find all these discoveries and, and point future anthropologists in the right direction. Um, away from these mythical wrong ideas that had been prevalent for so long. So it's almost like dialectical materialism unlocks these fields um, and and allows us to discover so much more about the world around us. Yeah, absolutely. That's why, I mean, um, I, I, I still hold that it's the most uh, powerful uh, tool that we can have to understand the world concretely because that's that's its whole aim understand the world as concretely as possible which in essence it, it doesn't mean just look at the things in the world and that's it no it means like see them in their interconnection and their development see the factors behind the fact you know there's a that's a cool play of words that i, I think marcuse is actually the first one who uses it um not a too much of a fan of marcuse but see the factors that lead to the fact right you know I, we've We've discussed before this sort of fetish of the fact that some people on the right use in their in their rhetoric, um, facts don't care about your feeling, et cetera. It's like, what are they thinking about when they think about a fact? You know, what's a fact to them? Because a fact just disconnected from its, its factors is shit. It's like getting to a boxing match uh, in the 12th round and, and trying to judge the fight. You can't do that, you know? And we all recognize you can't do that. But yet people want to pass judgment on things they just see without seeing them in their interconnection, in their development, in their history. And that's why I think that scientifically, um, in every field of, of scientific study, dialectical materialism is absolutely present. And one of the things that you find when you see the accounts of scientists from the West that went to the Soviet Union before it started to be like heavily demonized um, after Khrushchev's uh, quote-unquote secret speech, uh, was that they were all in awe by the fact that like a lot of their methodology back home although they weren't conscious of it, was uh, in line with dialectical materialism. Uh, and that's something that Engels realized already in, in his manuscripts on the dialectics of nature, which is that science eventually, by its own natural process of development, is going to have to break through the metaphysical outlook and achieve dialectical materialism in its methodology. Whether it's conscious of you know where that comes from or where those ideas first stemmed from, that's a whole other thing. But um, we see that in the accounts of these people that went to the Soviet Union and they were just in awe. Yeah, and that's kind of like the point I was getting at with Lewis Henry Morgan and, and Darwin. You said it better than me, but like just by, you know, the merits of their work, you know, they made breakthroughs in, in the fields of anthropology and the field of evolutionary biology. Um, but it looked very similar to dialectical materialism, and it was extremely influential on uh, Marx and Engels. Or um, Lewis Henry Morgan, at least, Marx um, admired him greatly and, and thought he um, was doing good work or making breakthroughs. And uh, similarly with Darwin, and it's it's just what you said. You know, as as those fields of science were advancing, um, sort of on their own they were starting to make a historical and, and dialectical materialist analysis um, of, of anthropology and of evolutionary biology. Um. 